Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. There was, in the 20th century, a teacher named Swami Lakshmanju, who was also a Kashmiri Pandit, and he was uh, a practitioner of Kashmir Shaivism and a teacher, a guru, and also very accomplished. And he helped a lot of the scholars from the West who were beginning to discover the tradition to unpack the texts that they were reading to understand them. Scholars came from all over the world for his advice on uh, you know, going through texts and what they meant, and many of them studied with him for a long time. And he had a lot of Indian students, but he also had a lot of American students. So he taught very often in English, and he really had very few words of English. If you, there are many um, videos of him on YouTube, and he's a sweet guy. I mean, you just look at him and your heart kind of melts. <laughs> but he really, his English is extremely halting. So... He has some modern disciples, people he left. Uh, he left two Indian women kind of in charge of the Indian part of his lineage, and then he left an American family that was very close to him, and especially their son, in charge of the kind of western side of the lineage. And they live in Culver City, Los Angeles, and near Los Angeles, and they uh, have published a lot of books in English and have uh, put all the stuff up on YouTube and everything. So I, I subscribe to their newsletter, and they, they send out tidbits rather frequently, which is nice, of teachings of Swami Lakshmanju. And this one is from his commentary on the uh, section of the Bhagavad Gita. And it's really an interesting moment, because in it he's kind of being tongue-in-cheek, He's enjoying being a bit of a rascal, <laughs> uh, giving his te- student, giving his students these very absolute teachings that cut through all fixation, all attachment, but at the same time admitting that even he is attached to these things that he's <laughs> cutting through. So uh, the name of the talk is "What is Real Devotion? What is Real Bhakti?" What is real upadesha? And the word upadesha is a word he's using to mean initiation. We say diksha to refer to the formal process of being initiated. Upadesha means a direct transmission. It really means transmission. And upade- you can say there are upadesha teachings. Upadesha teachings are when the teacher teaches from her or his own experience and is able to somehow convey in a more subtle way the actual fruit of that experience to the students so that they get some hit about that. So upadesha is used in that way. Upadesha could mean any situation of direct transmission. An upadesha text would be a text where a teacher was transmitting things they had realized, teachings not given to them by somebody else. And then upadesha in the sense that Swami Lakshmanju is using it means initiation because in the moment of initiation, of course, it's a moment of direct transmission. It's a, it's a moment when there's a possibility to have some uh, deeper experience of your own essence nature if you're open to that. Not everybody is, but there's that possibility there. So the name of this talk is What is Real Bhakti? What is Real Upadesha? And What is Real Seva? So they're talking about one of the chapters, uh, chapter 4, verse 34 in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's the Kashmiri rendition of the Bhagavad Gita. 
The Kashmiri version is slightly different than the version that we're used to. It's a little more yogic. It has some extra verses that kind of teach more of the view of Kashmir Shaivism. So he's quoting Lord Krishna, and again, this is Swami Lakshmanji talking, so the, the English is a little bit simplistic. It's not really a literal translation, uh, because even though he is a very wonderful Sanskrit scholar, able to explain the finest points of Sanskrit language, he has a hard time translating that into English. Right? So he says, Lord Krishna says in this verse, uh, that knowledge, meaning the knowledge of ultimate reality or of yourself, you will understand by bowing, bowing before them, the learned masters, by placing questions before them, by serving them. You will become one of those who have the real knowledge of God consciousness, who have the real observation of the Parabhairava state. You will become one of those who have the real knowledge of God consciousness who have the real observation of the Parabhairava state. So Parabhairava is just the supreme state, totally unconditioned, uncontrived, unlimited consciousness and energy. They will, by the means of upadesha, transmission, they will show you the reality of God consciousness. So this is Lord Krishna in Swami Lakshman's Jew's version talking about what happens when you prostrate in front of a teacher. And then he says, now he, meaning Krishna, commentates <laughs> upon these words in another way. That knowledge of Parabhairava can be attained by bowing your head before your masters. And then Swami Lakshmanji says, this is not the way, this is just fraud. <laughs> and then his student says, what? <laughs> this is a dialogue, the exact dialogue they were having. His student John, who is, what, what is his principal translator and principal person who has brought his books in English, uh, this, he was there in India when Swami Lakshmanji was giving these teachings with his wife and his son. John says, bowing your head before your master, and Swamiji says, Swami Lakshmiji says, what is the meaning of pran pranipatina then? This is the word for they're using for bowing your head. This bhakti with attachment, when you have got devotion for that, when you have devotion for that knowledge, that knowledge will come to you when you have devotion for that knowledge. So he says that devotion is for the knowledge of yourself. That, that what you're devoted to is that knowledge of that reality, of your own nature. That is the meaning, says Swami Lakshmanju, of bowing your head before your master. It is not the sign of bhakti when you go and catch hold of your master's feet and do like this. And then he says, Swamiji rubs his fingers over his eyes. I don't know what he's doing. But he says, that is not bhakti. And then what is bhakti? Bhakti is when you see that each and every object is the glamour of your own consciousness. That is bhakti. When you see that each and every object is the glamour, we could say the ornament of your own consciousness. That is bhakti. You should do that bhakti. You should not do this bhakti, showing respect through external prostrations. That is fraud. Jai! All disciples come before me and say, Jai! This is all fraud, nonsense! <laughs> you can tell he's really having fun. <laughs> so this is the absolute cutting through teaching. It's not when you just come through and go, Jai, oh master, oh I love you. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> what you are having devotion for is your own nature. If you're not bowing in front of the teacher because you are having an experience of your own nature, then that's what he's saying is fraud. And then he says, have you understood? When all objects are found to be one with Parabhairava, that is bhakti. 
And then he goes on to talk about initiation. Masters will initiate you, but initiation does not mean initiation. When you are initiated, the initiated person is not initiated. <laughs> what is initiated? Upadesha, direct transmission. It's not the external form, it's the transmission. You could be initiated while eating cereal with your teacher. You could be initiated you know, while just strolling around, shopping. The external form is not the initiation. Upadesha means to get God consciousness, and this is where his English flounders a little. Upadesha is to get God consciousness and keep it before you. That's initiation. Upa means to get nearer and nearer in God consciousness and keep it at your disposal. <laughs> that is Upadesha. Then his student says, keep God consciousness at your disposal, question mark. <laughs> God consciousness is kept at your disposal. That is Upadesha. Upa means near to your consciousness. To carry God consciousness near to your consciousness. That is Upadesha. Upadesha is not reciting, reciting Om, Kleem, Vairai, Vai, Anamaha. Uh, that is what masters say in the devotee's ear during initiation. That upadesha is not upadesha, it's all fraud. <laughs> I also do that, he says. <laughs> it says in, in brackets, then he laughs. <laughs> I also do that to everybody. <laughs> so he's saying, you know, even though I think it's fraud, I do it. And I tell them, you must go on reciting this mantra. <laughs> that is fraud. <laughs> What will happen to them by reciting this? There, and there are some people who like it, who go on saying it, who have no reservations. I will do that, they say. I am doing that to people. I am initiating them with mantra, and I know that they are a fraud. They are finished. They are placed away from God consciousness. By reciting those mantras, says another student. <laughs> They're all like, <laughs> yes, laughs Swamiji. Mantra recitation is not really recitation. Actual mantra recitation is just keeping at your disposal the real state of Bhairava. That is Upadesha. What else can I tell you about this? I don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs> he was in a mood that day. <laughs> and then he goes on uh, to give the teaching that I've always, that I have quoted many, many times, and we, that we actually, this teaching is very important for us at Jayakula, the one I'm about to give from him, uh, talking about the real meaning, real meaning of seva because our whole community is run on seva. And the last thing in the world that I want, and that I think many other people want, is for that seva to become some sort of ground for people to experience drudgery and grudgery, and to uh, turn this organization into some sort of task-oriented structure that loses sight of why we're doing anything. So unless we have a proper bhava while we're doing seva, unless we keep our God consciousness close while we're doing seva, there is no point in doing it at all. In fact, uh, as I've said many times, there's no point in having jayakula at all if we aren't going to have it as a form of practice. If we have jayakula over here because we think we need a structure in some ordinary mind way, and we're doing seva because we think we need to get things done. That is completely false view. And that just leads to all 
kinds of awful spiritual organizational stuff that takes people away from their practice. Right? We don't need Jayakula. We don't need Seva. I mean, in that ordinary mind way, we don't need any of it. You know, I could just come and give teachings and whatever happens, happens. We don't need any structure. But clearly the structure and the seva is, in this community for now, very, very integrated as people's practice. And everybody, or 95% of everybody anyway, knows that. And we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep that close to us. Otherwise, we're going to turn into one of those Organiza- spiritual organizations that we all complain about. <laughs> we don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, where everybody's uh, pissed off and uh, not doing their practice and participating in this huge effort to maintain structures, but they're not actually doing practice, and it all just becomes pointless. You know, you might as well get a corporate job and earn some money if you're going to do that. <laughs> so, this is what Swamiji has to say about Seva. Sevaya means abhyasana. When you try to stay in that state of God consciousness, that is seva. That is selfless service. You're literally not being yourself. You're staying in the state of God consciousness. You're not being that little self. That seva is not when you do work for your teacher. Seva is not when you do work for your community. Seva is when you remain in the state of God consciousness. So when we're doing that, what we're doing is we're practicing integrating. We're practicing integrating what we do in the cushion and what we discover on the cushion, however much we can discover, we're, we're practicing integrating that into everyday life when we're doing seva. Seva is often translated as selfless service, right? So then everyone tries to make up what that might possibly mean. Uh, and then usually just gives up and forgets about it and treats it like ordinary work because we don't really know what it means to be selfless and be serving. Or, or sometimes people will They'll do some very small amount of seva and let everybody know about it and, you know, print on to everybody in between tasks. <laughs> Nobody ever does that here. They wouldn't dare. But, you know, <laughs> I, have, I have seen that. <laughs> I have seen that, you know. It's like advertising the fact that you're doing seva and making it all look all holy schmoly and then going home and never showing up again. <laughs> Because you don't really want to do any work. What Swami Lakshmanji says about seva is that seva is integrating. It's integrating that God consciousness, that whatever you have learned of that in a real sense, it's being in the state of your practice while you're serving. It's also noticing how you're showing up and using your practice to work with that and bringing all of those moments of seva onto your path to help you to wake up. I am so not interested in people being an ordinary mind uh, and being in this community. It doesn't mean that we can't have ordinary fun, but we're not compartmentalizing. I'm not interested in that compartmentalizing, that like part of this is spiritual practice and part of it isn't. I realize that not everyone or hardly anyone can have that kind of seamless experience. So I'm not saying that we have to try to and have, you know, step into that just because I said that's what I want. We all have to be where we are. But my job is to continually tear down those walls between ordinary mind and enlightened mind, basically. Until you can enjoy ordinary everyday life from the condition of uncontrived, spontaneous freedom. So it's not like we're going to go anywhere and ordinary life is going to suddenly be draped in silks with bells ringing and angels flying around. It's not like that at all. We, we're going to just have everything be exactly the way it is. This world is God already, right? I'm not interested in living in a theater of holiness either. So the idea is that we relax and we wake up and then everything is that. We realize that everything is that. And we can just enjoy it the way that it is without doing anything about it particularly. But in order to get there, we have to bring everything onto the path. Something, whatever we're doing, we have to be remembering and be trying to be in the state of our practice. So that's what Swami Lakshmanji was actually talking about in all three of these sections. Whatever we're doing, whether we're reciting mantra, 
right? or listening to the teacher or bowing down at the teacher's feet or getting initiated or doing housework or making food for our community or cleaning up the space or doing uh, other things that need to be done. Whatever we're doing, we're always trying to be in the state of our practice. We're always trying to be in the state of upadesha, direct transmission. We're always trying to be porous and open to whatever is coming to us. We're always being aware of how we're showing up. We're always being immersed in our practice as much as we possibly can. We try to remember to do that. And everybody's practice is at exactly, you know, a very different place. So your trying to be in the state of your practice is going to be different than somebody else's. That we're all at different stages, including me. I'm just on the path like you are, right? So we're all just doing our best to do that, and that is the purpose of Jayakula, to have a kind of field of play to do that in. Right? Jayakula as an organization, we have a board, we have the crucibles, we have a lot of structure now, we didn't at first, right? Um, we have a bi-coastal community, we have seva going on, uh, for those of you that are new, a couple of years ago the community came together and decided to run this as a seva organization. And, you know, we have all these things happening and there's some people that are actually spending almost 100% of their time working on Jayakula stuff. And every bit of it is for and only for the purpose of helping you to wake up. I simply have no interest in anything else. If I thought somehow that the community was getting away from that and going off in some other direction and I couldn't do anything about it, I would leave in a hot second. <laughs> I have absolutely no attachment to this community other than I think it's absolutely marvelous that we're all doing this. I think it's marvelous because everyone, by and large, does get what it's about. But if somehow you forgot... I could walk away from it in, in a, really a half second. Wow. Wow, you didn't know that already? <laughs> I guess not, no. You mean in a different way, There's nothing that I've been more discouraged about in other communities I've known or been in is than when people get so attached to the community as a something or other that they don't practice. I just find that sad. To me, this is a field of play. It's a field of sadhana, and that's all it is. Now, Ma basically ordered me to form this community, and times when I wanted to walk away has ordered me not to. So, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, this is Ma's doing that this, this community has come together like this. And we're all doing our best, I know we are. Uh, but I really encourage everybody, whatever you're doing with the community, to treat it as sadhana and to not compartmentalize any part of it and to give it your all. As Ma says, the more we give, the more comes to us. And actually more comes to you than what you give. You get more back than what you give. Because we're, indi you know, as individuals, individual styles of Shiva nature, you know, we have a lot of limitation. But the ability of this reality to give is unlimited. So you give this much, you get that much. But if you give your all, the doors open wide. You will get unimaginable riches totally unexpected riches. That's been my experience. And I'm not even giving my all. <laughs> I eat too many holy donuts to claim that I'm giving my all. <laughs> They're so good. <laughs> and I watch way too much science fiction. <laughs> I'm bringing science fiction onto my path. <laughs> 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 the 
That's our new tagline. <laughs> Where no science fiction has ever gone before. <laughs> I hope that got on the recording. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.